Hello, I'm Dr. Marla Dubinsky from the Icon School of Medicine, Mount Sinai, New York, and I'm here with my colleague, Dr. David Binion from the University of Pittsburgh. And we're here today to talk a little bit about some of the key teachings and learnings we um, have discussed during the day today at the Great Debates and Updates in IBD here in Dallas on uh, August 25th, 2018. So thanks, David, for joining me. Thank you. Um, today, I really love both your talks, um, in particular s the discussion around biosimilars and how we're going to integrate this into our practice as a lot of us are seeing patients who may move from one institution to the next and for example where I am we predominantly use um, Innovator or Originator uh, infliximab but when they go to college and other places including overseas mm -hmm. patients are getting biosimilars. So, how should we look at this as something that we should be concerned about? And talk a little bit about some of the data you showed today about the studies sure. that have addressed this particular matter. So, so biosimilars are going to be a reality in inflammatory bowel disease. Um, our colleagues in Europe have actually had a few years of experience with biosimilar compounds. And I think there's some anxiety in part because we've not perhaps heard about this topic until fairly recently in the United States. Um, so what happens is the uh, patent protection for some of the originator compounds that have actually gone on for, we've, we've become quite familiar with them over the past two decades. Those patents have been expired and other companies that make recombinant antibodies for therapeutic purposes are moving into that space to make essentially uh, similar compounds to infliximab and adalimumab. Um, so our colleagues in Europe have actually had several years of experience using um, biosimilar infliximab. There have been a series of studies done, and some of the confusion comes from the fact that when a biosimilar is being investigated, it's not mandatory for that agent to have specific trial data for each of the indications that it could be used for. Um, so sometimes rheumatologic data is used as the proof that the compound is similar and safe and effective, and then that data is extrapolated into inflammatory bowel disease. So perhaps the uh, the best study to date is a paper that comes from Norway. It was published in Lancet. It's called the Norswich trial. And there was over 500 patients who were randomized to either make the transition to a biosimilar compound in Flectra or stay on the originator compound Remicade. And they were tracked out to a year. Um, and this was across the rheumatologic indications as well as inflammatory bowel disease, both Crohn's and UC. And there was no difference in outcomes at the end of a year. Patients were doing well in all regards. Um, there have been some additional studies that have been carried out where um, single centers have actually tracked out outcomes to two years with similar um, good results. Again, pr pretty reassuring. And then there was a um, multi-center, multi-national effort on the part of um, Inflectra to look at in induction and maintenance. And again, it's a pretty similar message that these compounds will behave in a similar fashion to the originator compounds. So I think we have, I think we have some reassurance from what's emerging um, throughout the rest of the world. Um, here in the United States, these compounds are fairly new. Um, there are new names that are associated with these um, compounds. So you'll see names like infliximab-dyyb as an example. So that's an example of a biosimilar infliximab. So when you see this, there has been a substitution. Now, depending on what state a person is in in the U.S., there may be notification or the interchangeability or, excuse me, but the, the switch to the biosimilar may be done automatically on the part of pharmacies. Um, I think at this point we are in a little bit of a learning curve in terms of the concept of interchangeability. Yeah, can you sort of educate me on the difference and are we really going to know what our patients were on if there's multiple different biosimilars and I know that the FDA may not have guidance on it but does that mean that the pharmacists or anybody else could do what they would like to do regardless of what the patient was on? Again those are tough questions in part because I think there's state regulations that are going to come into play and in Pennsylvania where I work it's actually required for pharmacists to make an attempt to use a generic when it comes to a brand name um, agent that is a, a chemical type of a, a therapeutic drug. In terms of biosimilars, I think there's going to be notification um, because the biosimilars are a little bit different. And at this point, we have some faith that 
the originator can be switched to a biosimilar, but the anticipation is that that person will stay on that biosimilar for some time. Um, much of this discussion is an economic discussion. The rationale for this is that the biosimilars are going to theoretically create a competition in the therapeutic um, space for inflammatory bowel disease patients and actually hopefully lower the cost of these agents and make accessibility to drugs perhaps a little bit easier for some of our patients. Because I think in some of the work you've done at University of Pittsburgh, I'm guessing discussions around which anti-TNF you're using must come into play in your model of economics in terms of cost savings, right? So does that discussion happen a lot, you think, across the country whereby there is this discussion that we have to move in this direction purely from an economic argument without necessarily having the same requirements of data, mm -hmm. as you noted, for example, for IBD, extrapolation was from RA predominantly mm -hmm. into Crohn's and, Crohn's and UC. And I believe that the comfort level, that one well, that was an interesting study, you talked about how over time in Europe, mm -hmm. when they ask physicians, do they feel more comfortable with the use, do you think that's just because they got used to it and it was forced upon them and everything was fine and there was a relief kind of that we weren't seeing patients fall apart once they were switched despite the studies not being done in IBD? So the, the study that you alluded to, Silvio Danese, um, did a survey um, in the early time period when biosimilars were emerging in Europe. And then they followed it up two to three years later with a, a follow-up survey and they asked practitioners what their um, thoughts were and how they had confidence or perhaps some trepidation regarding biosimilars. The initial time period there was a lot of concern that biosimilars might be problematic. But when people became more familiar with them and patients were being transitioned to biosimilars, they actually gained a level of confidence. So I take some um, uh, comfort in that, um, that data. Um, I think that the data that has emerged in terms of safety and efficacy is fairly strong, so that's good. Um, the, some of the issues that I've heard about in the United States concern perhaps the tiering of anti-TNFs on the part of insurance companies, on the part of payers, where there may be a preference for a subcutaneous agent, which is a little bit more flexible in terms of not needing the infusion mm -hmm. clinic, but because a biosimilar product is perhaps less expensive, that is actually being the preferred choice for an initiation of a biologic. So instead of getting access to perhaps adalimumab, a person is being given a biosimilar infliximab with a nurse who would come to the house and perhaps administer it. So I think those types of uh, pharmaceutical um, uh, choices and changes that are really not being driven by the physician and the patient are going to be a little bit more concerning because there's uh, many issues that come into play in terms of being able to stay on drugs, maintain work schedules, travel schedules. Um, if people are headed off to college, it might be a little bit more flexible in some regards to have something that they could have uh, self-administered. So it sounds like it feels like it's a race to the bottom in terms of cost, and that's who's going to win um, in a very complex um, healthcare structure when it comes to the cost of our medications. And I think if I could summarize that it appears that we shouldn't be as worried as biosimilar about the impact of biosimilars on our outcome of our patients if they are forced to switch from a, because of their payer. Um, also, the idea that patients who switched, there is not an increased risk of developing antibodies because I think anti-drug antibodies, I think that was a lot of the fear was that um, you're doing well on one, it was a non-medical switch, meaning it wasn't for medical reasons that you were forced to switch. Are people all of a sudden gonna get antibodies to a new form of infliximab? And I think you sort of explained that that does not appear to be the case. I think one teaching point for everybody is that if they did get antibodies to the originator, not to put them on a biosimilar. Right, so I, I Same think drug. It's, it's essentially, similar. Um, it's a similar enough drug that we would be concerned that immunogenicity with an allergic type of reaction against the first compound would also produce an allergic type of reaction against the biosimilar okay. compound. So unfortunately, we're not gonna be able to resurrect 
that first um, agent with the use of the biosimilar. Um, but again, the, the data that's emerged in terms of therapeutic drug monitoring from some of our, again, our colleagues in Europe who've used these agents longer is that the, the, the TDM assays for trough levels and for anti-drug antibodies appear to function in a fairly similar fashion. So just uh, also two points. We don't have a biosimilar adalimumab at the moment. That is, uh, sorry, there was approval, but it's not widely available or we can't write for that at the moment or we're not forced to write for a uh, biosimilar adalimumab. Mm -hmm. And the second point uh, also is the idea that the name. So can you just remind us of the naming and the difference between what's in Europe versus here? even for the same product, just so I can... So, so in the U.S. we have two um, biosimilar versions of infliximab. So we have a compound, the, the trade name is Inflectra, and the FDA designation is infliximab-DYYB. Okay. So we're going to start to see these types of um, uh, initials added onto the name, and that's the designation of the biosimilar compound. Because biosimilars are similar but not identical, there is an attempt of the FDA to keep track of these agents and to perhaps do medical surveillance or biovigilance in terms of how we move forward with safety issues. So we will see these um, names of infliximab that have letters attached to the back. Um, so we have um, two compounds in the U.S. that have been approved, um, the compound Inflectra and the compound Renflexis. Okay. And that has a different designation. Yes, and I'm going to get those letters incorrect if I try to remember them. There's, an, there's two A's in it. That's what I remember. From. <laughs> so that already explains the complexity of this, and this is just for the first two. So I think this is a space that we have to get comfortable with, and I think what remains to be seen is sort of how you highlighted the fact that maybe there will be a forced step through IV biosimilar even before a subcutaneous for reasons of cost. So let's see how that all um, evolves. But that kind of does lead nicely into your other lecture because when you talk about um, how patients have access to new drugs mm -hmm. um, because of the possible step through concept that we, for example, when vetalizumab came out, some people had to fail two TNFs, which again, if they failed the first one, not because of antibodies, the chance of them responding to a second or a third was not going to be any better. Chances are. So we've been, uh, we were sort of forced that when we had that back in 2014, and now in May of 2018, we had tofacitinib or Zelgens that was approved for ulcerative colitis, so the first oral small molecule for UC. Um, we're just starting to get a feel for how the payers and how patients are implementing this new therapy. But that was kind of a future therapy f a couple of months ago, so we can um, just maybe highlight a little bit about TOFA um, and then head into some of the discussions you had about the future targets. So I think we can all agree that this is an incredibly exciting time for inflammatory bowel disease because we have this renaissance of new agents, these biologic um, uh, uh, agents that are going to be leukocyte trafficking inhibitors. So we're going to have a series of those drugs come through the FDA approval process in all likelihood in the next few years. So it won't be a single or perhaps two agents. We're going to have a series of uh, molecules that are going to be targeted and hopefully we'll, we'll keep our fingers crossed that we have more, more tools to choose from. Um, you mentioned some of the additional um, agents that are going to move through. I think the anti-IL-23 inhibitors have shown tremendous promise in psoriasis, and they are starting to pass the FDA approval process and become routinely available for patients who have psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. And we're going to have, um, again, the very uh, robust trial data that's getting published now hopefully translate into FDA approval for more agents in that space, targeting a little more selectively the IL-23 pathway. So explain then the concept, for example, of stikinumab, which is mm -hmm. IL-12 and IL-23 inhibition. That's kind of, the 12 is coming out of play and focusing really even more specific, like sort of a missile targeting exactly that pathway of IL-23. So the only downside is that we're all going to need PhDs in immunology right. to understand the drugs that are going to be available to treat our patients. So the complexity of our understanding and the, the intricacies of how the immune system works in some 
problems, but perhaps not in others. And side effects might be related to certain pathways and certain conditions, but not in others. This is going to become um, the, the, perhaps the cutting edge of inflammatory bowel disease over the next few years. So the next generation of drugs that are going to target that pathway are going to be the P19 selective inhibitors. And there are a series of drugs that actually target that pathway, again, with tremendous efficacy in, in psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, and very, very promising early results for both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis in the IBD space. Yeah, because the IL P19 or IL-23, <clears throat> we have risenkinumab for mm -hmm. Crohn's disease, and um, we also have it for ulcerative colitis. Um, the um, IL-23 pathway blockade for UC as well. But also the question on, it's not just, the, so there's biologics, which is this class, there's the inhib the adhesion molecule, so etrolizumab, mm -hmm. which is an alpha-4-E7, I understand from your talk, as opposed to an alpha-4-beta-7. So there's even subtypes of the integral blockades. And then there's oral small molecules as mm -hmm. well. So maybe talk to some of the more specific JAK1, for example, or the uh, other types of um, oral small molecules. So the, the small molecule inhibitors are pills that a person would take perhaps twice a day, perhaps once a day, it depends on the agent moving forward. And they're gonna target some of what are called uh, intracellular signal transduction pathways. So these are how uh, many of the immune cells in the body are going to activate the inflammatory process. These small molecules will be basically taken into those cells and they can selectively block certain components of that signal transduction that's occurring in the immune system. Um, the current agent that just made it through the FDA approval process is the agent tofacitinib, which is, has been approved for rheumatoid arthritis for a few years now. Um, it had very promising trial results in ulcerative colitis and it's going to become routinely available because of the FDA approval earlier this year. Um, that's a uh, JAK1, JAK3 inhibitor. Some of the selective JAK1 inhibitors are actually showing quite a bit of promise, both for ulcerative colitis and also potentially for Crohn's disease. Um, there's perhaps a little bit more flexibility with these drugs, in part because they're not antibody-based um, therapies. We hope that there's going to be less immunogenicity as a result of that. It doesn't appear that it's going to be quite as essential to have the drug levels, drug monitoring, um, be as, as critical a component of their routine use. So, Again, we have a series of these molecules moving forward. Patacitinib is one example, filgotinib is another example. And we'll see what happens as the trial data uh, continues to accumulate. But again, our understanding of intracellular signal transduction and how to target it therapeutically is something that's going to become, I think, a much more powerful area for the treatment of inflammation. Yeah, so there's even the oral integrin blockers potentially mm -hmm. in S1P1 or Xanamod is exactly. another one. Um, so I think you've sort of, we've set the stage that we are getting more targeted, it sounds like, even in the biologic space as well as in the uh, oral small molecule space. And so just hearing your lecture and thinking about all of this, you're right, you need a PhD to even keep up with all of the various targets that will be available. But the question still remains, do we really have tools that can help us decide you're gonna be someone who gets JAK1 inhibition, I'm gonna be someone who gets TNF or IL-23 or, you know, it really will require that researchers keep up with that precision medicine platform mm -hmm. concept. And if not, we'll be exactly where we are right now, where we've got lots of toys to play with, we just don't know how to, how to play with them. So, so I think one of the key things that is essential for us to make progress in inflammatory bowel disease, and I, I, I use the term clinical decision support, and this is um, basically understanding the natural histories of patient subgroups um, and being able to figure out as early as possible who is going to benefit from which molecular pathway that will be integrally linked to their disease process. And in some regards, this is the holy grail of precision medicine. Um, are we there yet? Not quite. We're not there quite yet, but there is promise. Um, there are some signals. Um, this is what much of what we do at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, we've made a big effort in understanding natural histories of patients over time and then starting to reverse engineer perhaps signatures, biomarkers, or even genetic signatures that will then associate with therapeutic pathways and ultimately success in terms of taking care of our patients. So 
we're in an early phase of that part of the field. Um, colleagues, researchers throughout the world are starting to make some headway in this space. And clinical decision support, I think, will be really essential for practitioners and physicians to be able to understand the complexity of what we're talking about. And that's going to be the, the future of precision yeah. medicine and IBD. Well, I think you said it so nicely, so I thank you very much for sharing your insights into these uh, very, very important topics that we learned here. Had great debates and updates. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you.